and Angel, I've noticed that I assumed that there was no tunneling, okay? So let me just summarize for you what happens in field theory. Re really, the way the, the system tunnel, the way you go from a local minimum into a global one, in this particular case, imagine that this is a true minimum, as I draw it, okay, this is not, so there will be tunneling. And the way it happens is actually the, the usual phase transition that we are used to. You have to form the bubbles. Okay, Coleman shows that in his beautiful work. This is Coleman in the 70s, I think 74. That you would have to form the bubble of the new vacuum and then it has to grow. The way you get a phase transition when you heat up water, okay, this is interesting. The bottom line is, I'm just going to cite it for you. Imagine this situation, there is a small difference between the energy levels of these two vacuum. It's a order epsilon, mass scale to the force to get the right dimensions, right potential is mass to the force. So I'm taking epsilon much smaller than V. Okay, this is the example, it's called a thin wall. It's sort of, Coleman shows that the bubble has a thin wall. These are just words at this point. But in this case, you can actually f do the analytic calculation and show the probability that I go from here to here is proportional to e to the minus coefficient that he calls b, and b becomes O order. There are non trivial unit numbers and pi to whatever. But roughly, what you get, you get v over epsilon to a huge power 12. Right, notice the way I've written. When phi is plus V, I get zero. When phi is minus V, I'll get a negative result, right? So this is a lower minimum. So note it is it it goes to zero extremely fast. When epsilon goes to zero, it's it's e to the minus infinity very quickly. Okay. I mean I'm just citing the result, it's not that I'm explaining what really goes on. Okay. One can do this calculation. And eventually, if those of you who are interested, you can learn enough of field theory to do that after your course. Okay, so let me let me raise this. This was some <coughs> discussion. Uh, we could also change the vacuum by the going to high temperatures and then coming back, right? Sure. Sure. That will be sort of interesting to watch. You hit it up. You go to the phase, and then you will wait till it pulls down. Okay. Now, universe. It seems we are not going to heat up the universe. Unfortunately, <laughs> I like the picture of of cyclic universe, the big bang, right? <coughs> because there is a sort of interesting question: How did this whole bloody thing start? Now, if the universe would have enough matter, you can imagine it would recollapse. Enough, obviously. I don't have to compute it. Enough is enough. Gravitation pull will make it go back, you will have another Big Bang, and the Big Bang... It turns out that there is an entropy growth through this, so the cycles become bigger and bigger. I like that picture, but it doesn't seem to be true. There is not enough matter in the universe. Now we know, you know, there is dark matter and all that stuff, we know how much there is. It seems the universe is just going to be cooling down. It's a sort of uh, an easy feeling, you know, it gives you a sense of anxiety. It's going to die. If this is true, and if these laws of nature are universal and don't change with time, the universe will just... Basically, the temperature will become so small that the life will disappear. And not be recreated. You see, the temperature is so huge. You know, it's, it's, this is the problem. This issue, this was studied, an issue of what, how you would see spontaneous symmetry breaking, which just studied before you guys showed up, would be to heat it up to very to above the scale of the physics in question. This was studied by Kirchnitz in the early 70s and Linde. There is a beautiful paper, there are actually two beautiful papers that generalize this to any gauge theory, especially Weinberg work I like. Where there is Shakib and Coleman, where there is a beautiful paper by Weinberg, it must be around the same year when he does tunneling. There is a paper of Weinberg on high temperature. where you can find the generic formulas for any theory in question, okay? And, you know, he's discussing this unfortunate thing that the temperature is so big on the order of 100 GeV. Uh, 
one Kelvin is of order 10 to the 4 electron volt. 10 to the minus 4 electron volt. So, so this is huge, right? One electron volt 10 to the 4 Kelvin, this is 10 to 11 electron volts, about 10 to the 15 Kelvin. You know? it's, this is too hard. So we won't be seeing that. We cannot hope to read such temperature. This is simply science fiction at this point. We have to really think, you and I will have to worry a lot, how do we really see that there was a spontaneous symmetry break? Okay, so we did this discrete case. And we found that there was a massive, normally behaved particle, which I gave a name Higgs, it was not correct. Okay, I call it H, you know, I anticipated. There is no gauge symmetry in question. But what was important that the mass is proportional to the vacuum expectation value. It had to be because this is the only scale here. And in order to get a mass, you have to interact with the Higgs field. Quote, unquote, this guy that is responsible for symmetry breaking. So in order for him to get the right mass, he has to, this guy has to interact with itself. That's why you got an expression proportional to lambda. You will see this will be the rule always. If you ask me what will be the electron mass, well, it's going to be proportional to the same well with its appropriate electron coupling. And if you ask me, well, what do you think will be the W mass, you will see it, it, it will have to be proportional to V with the appropriate coupling, which will be gauge coupling, and so on and so forth. So here you are catching the essence of the uh, Higgs mechanism. But before we do the Higgs, we want to do number Goldstone mechanism, and that is the spontaneous symmetry breaking of a global symmetry. So I'm going to start with you on global. So phi transforms is e to the i alpha q phi. We always get this q. Well, I'll take u equal one. I have just one field, so I can always normalize it. Okay. So let me not worry. About it. It's like saying that q phi is phi charge one. How does my Lagrangian look like? One half d mu. No, let me not put the half. D mu phi star d mu phi minus v of phi. Why? Because I want to write this is normally we do with a complex number phi 1 plus i phi 2 and then we normalize it with the square root of 2, okay, conventionally. So that phi 1 and phi 2 have the usual kinetic energies, okay. I could have written phi 1 plus i phi 2 and then put a half here, but this is a more common convention. The potential, it's all here. It's going to be basically the same, right? It will be lambda over 4. Now it has to be phi square minus v square, everything square. So let me put, because of the square root 2, let me put 2 phi square to keep the normalization as before, since I introduced it here. What is the vacuum manifold? There is obviously spontaneous symmetry breaking well, there are lesser of the picture. The potential will look sort of like this. This is what you call the sombrero, a Mexican head potential. Phi 1, phi 2, V. Draw it in the coordinates real coordinates is better, and we get this. Uh, notice the active potential surface is, you told me yesterday, it's a circle. So the vacuum manifold, we have this fancy language, okay, is a circle. What is the vacuum manifold? M0, in set of all points phi 0, so that V is 0, that's a minimum. So that means that uh, let me write this, phi 1 0 square plus phi 2 0 square is v square. And this is a circle. It's here manifestly. You know, it, this, it costs me no, it may cost me kinetic energy, but it costs me no potential energy to go around the circle. 
So I would guess, this is what Nambu did, he guessed basically without even doing the calculation, that probably should be a massless excitation. It would not be surprising if there is a massless state that corresponds to this. You know, mass shows you resistance. Mass gives you resistance to the to the energy, to the to the to the potential, if you wish, energy, right? Uh, uh, second derivative and the mass square is positive, second derivative is positive there. But we have an equipotential surface, so we could guess. And you will see immediately if I write like this, let me write another way. Let me choose a, since there is no tunneling I established there, I will choose one particular vacuum. We, can, we could call it my, you know, Goran's vacuum, okay? I'm going to take, I'm going to write this as V plus H. Let me take it to be real, plus IG over square root of 2. Same normalization, I keep. So what is H? Is the guy that lives around the vacuum expectation value. If I have taken a minus V, I would write minus V plus H and so on. I could have taken V e to the i pi over 4, whatever. I chose this point. You can choose another point. And this complex? Yeah. Yes. No, V I took real. I've chosen a point here. I want to live here. It cannot matter where I decide to live because of the symmetry. Just in the case of two points. It's the same what I call left and what I call right, whether I took plus V or minus V, the physics has to be the same, okay, in, the, in this case. Whether you say I want to live here or I want to live here, it, of course you'll get the same physics. How can the physics differ? There was a complete symmetry between these two points. Nothing to distinguish it. Occasionally we'll show explicitly how physics does not depend on the vacuum. And most of the time I won't, do, I won't bother, I'll ask you to. If you have your doubts, you check it. And then, you know, I can just take an arbitrary point and show you it does not depend on the phase. In order to simplify, I've chosen this. So what is V? Lambda over 4. Look at my potential there. 2 will cancel, so I'll get V plus H square, plus G square, minus V square, everything square. Do we agree? I said before, I, I should have mentioned that if the, uh, maybe I should have commented here, I'm, I'm sorry, B was V over epsilon to some large power, it turned out to be 12, so it happened. I should have commented, normally you would, you, you know, remember in WKB, the tunneling depending on the distance between these two guys and depending on the height. Note in this case I simplify the matters, okay, the height is given by V and the distance is given by V. The distance is 2V, so, so this is why the distance disappeared, it's hidden in V. Okay, here there is both the distance, so I don't, I don't know how it went as a distance because of it shows them, it would be maybe nicer Well, Coleman took this example, so I borrowed from him. And, and we could have chosen so you know, there is always some small probability, and then if the probability is on the order of 10 to the 10 years, you know, there would be a reason for anxiety, says Coleman, with his dry humor. Okay. If, if, you know, we would have to worry about that in any theory beyond the standard model, we may find more than one vacuum, and you may have to worry how long-lived our, our vacuum is, if it's not the global <laughs> minimum. And there are examples when you can show that we cannot live in a global minimum. Something called supergravity theory, doesn't matter, Weinberg showed in 1982 within a particular class of so-called supersymmetric theories based on supergravity. 
you would actually know that you cannot live in the global minimum. And then he went on to show that the lifetime would be long, it wouldn't worry. Sorry, this digression because I forgot to mention. So notice here um, that what I get is lambda over 4, 2VH plus H square plus G square, everything square. V square cancelled. But the fact that V square is cancelled, you notice immediately G is going to be masses. There is no quadratic piece in G. I will get one half MH square H square. Notice that MH square is the same expression as before. I got the same V plus H square. Notice it must change the choice of the potentials. No matter how complicated the scalar field we choose. We are always going to find this H field, which I started to call Higgs already, which is the guy that lives around the vacuum expectation value. It's the guy who shows this, give us these little excitations about the minimum. Okay. Its mass is as before, and that's why I told you you have everything here. And then you get 2 and 2 and 4, lambda V H, H square plus G square, plus lambda over 4 a square plus g square, everything square. And g is manifest to zero. This is called the number Goldstone boson. Actually, most often it's called Goldstone boson. Goldstone generalizes this in a simple example. Number notice when, when there is a, a symmetry breaking. Remember how we classified the symmetry in the discrete set? set? We said that the symmetry is broken because d acting of phi zero gave us minus phi zero. In other words, d acting of phi zero did not give us phi zero. The vacuum knew about the symmetry, okay. Notice in this case, we have exactly the same situation when Q acts on phi zero. Why not I keep this Q and Q phi is phi, Q is one. Just to emphasize, Q phi zero in my case is phi zero. It is not zero. A vacuum carries charge. This is indication that the symmetry will be broken. This is how we know that the symmetry is broken. This is what we can do before finding the consequences. Just take the appropriate generator, in this case charge, and check how it acts on the vacuum. If it does not give you zero, that means that the vacuum should be empty. We, the name vacuum actually is a bad name. This ground state is not a vacuum. It's full of this strange charge. It's some kind of ether. <coughs> you know, really, the, 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 the vacuum you and I live in we know today is full of this Higgs field. It's classical value. Equivalent is the saying, you know, call this U. This we call U. The U1 unitary transformation, right? The equivalent statement is this U phi zero. So Q phi zero is different from zero. This is an indication of spontaneous symmetry break. Equivalently, u phi zero then is not equal to phi zero. E to the i alpha q, obviously. Another way of seeing it. Vacuum is not invariant under the particular rotation in question. Okay. If, it's, if I choose a su2, that will mean that I will, there will be a su2 rotations that will not annihilate the vacuum charges. There should two rotations that will not leave the vacuum in the very end. So this is a measure of spontaneous symmetry breaking and we are now proving the Goldstone theorem which says whenever a particular charge is broken, there is a massless particle <coughs> that you and I should call number Goldstone boson and, and you will forgive me if I, if I custom call it Goldstone boson.
Number suggested the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking and all this is mechanism. Goldstone generalized it about a year or two later, in 1961, 1962, he wrote a couple of beautiful papers. And which he noticed what was very important, that there was this H field whose mass is given by this. Which I claim should have been enough for Goldstone to get the Nobel Prize. I think it's a shame that he didn't get it because exactly the same situation you and I will get when we do the the gauge symmetry. The only difference will be that alpha will be a function of x. But h doesn't care. You see, because h, its properties are derived from the potential. In the potential, you don't care whether the symmetry is continuous or not. There are no derivatives in the potential. When you think of the potential, the global symmetry is equivalent to a local symmetry. By the way, this sort of thing that requires a calculation, I could see in the following manner. I could have written, so this is one way of writing it, phi. It's here. I could also can read, I could have written phi. This is one of point, choosing the right variables, okay? Make sure you choose the right variables, <laughs> otherwise you live to regret it, says Weinberg. I could have written like this e to the i g over v v plus h over square root of 2 here I wrote g as an imaginary component here I'm writing it as a phase notice I have to put 1 over v to get a dimension as quantity this is an exponential dimension of g is 1 as you know in the units of mass and dimension of e is 1 because but here, <laughs> I don't know why I have to say that. Obviously, they have the same dimension. I'm sorry. Doesn't matter what it is. So I have to write G or V. Notice that if I expand it, they, they, I will get precisely this, and then there will be some higher order term. Expand this, you will get 1 plus, so it will be 1 plus I G over V plus higher order terms. Actually, I should put a different name here. But I don't want to do that. Forgive me. Nomenclature becomes complicated. This is a different field from this one, okay? But the leading order is the same, so I'm keeping the name. G over V times V of plus times H plus, plus V over H. This is all divided by square root of 2. No. Why am I saying this is not? This is V plus H. One should not be here. Why don't I write it better? This is I G over V V plus H over square root of two. <laughs> Sorry. Plus other terms. This is obviously uh, V plus H plus i g over square root of 2 plus higher order terms. So notice that the leading order... Uh, 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 what, is, <coughs> what is an interesting thing about this notation? Let me raise this. You, you have this, right? I'll summarize it. Notice there is always be this ma square. We should never raise it no matter how complicated the example I take. Now, why is this notation... What was the useful thing about this notation? Or this uh, choice of variable? That... I had a complicated potential. But my... kinetic energy was simple. Notice what happens with this particular convention. This is, these are pros and cons. This is when you have to decide which variables to use. Because what's going to happen immediately, in this case the potential V, which is lambda over 4, phi square minus V square, everything square, this guy disappears the way I wrote it. So I get lambda over 4, V plus H square minus V square, everything square. But this is a discrete potential I had before. So notice, I can always, if I'm smart enough, I can always go back to that 
thing that I just get the uh, H field. It's manifest here that the G is zero, the G is massless. And the mass of H, of course, is what I found before. You may say, but where the hell did G disappear? Well, it didn't disappear. It's here. I got a very simple potential, but I have a terrible kinetic energy. Because there will be interactions, OK, d mu phi now is, is, is d mu h plus i d mu g over v, v plus h. 1 over 2, there is any friend. And then I get this. Right? Because when I act with the covariant derivative, <coughs> I act on the right-handed component, I get d mu h. But then when I act here, I get d mu g over v times v over h. I took a half outside. So notice I get a terrible derivative interaction. This is not so useful if I want to do computations, OK? You and I don't know how to deal with such interactions, OK? All hell breaks loose. The interaction depends on the momentum of the particle, OK? These are non-local interactions. But what is good about this particular gauge, sometimes people call it a gauge. There is no gauge. There is no gauge symmetry. Or if you use a variable, that you can check the physics immediately. There was something very useful. By writing this, I found immediately the physical states. I don't have to do a calculation. Mg is zero. So immediately disappear from the potential. The only place a particle can get the mass is in the potential. So you and I should be able to go from one gate to another. That's going to be the crux, the essence of this course. That's the most important point in the standard world. That's what Hoff taught us in the early 70s. Ten years after Glacier wrote his paper, and four or five years after Weinberg wrote his paper on the Higgs on the standard model, we'll come to that. Please stop me here if there is. We are now introducing some non trivial concepts. A massless scalar particle is very interesting because massless particles give you long range forces, right? So they're, 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 they're somehow fantastic. It would be great if such particle existed. Right? It, they, 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 it, would, it would sort of simulate the gravity in some sense. Of course, you would have to understand what the couples do. We'll, we'll talk about it. There is no physical example. The, 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 the symmetries in question in the standard models are gauge symmetries, not global symmetries. People have speculated on potential global symmetries. Can you think of any global symmetries you can imagine? It cannot be electromagnetic, child symmetry, that's gauge. It cannot be the symmetry corresponding W. It's not actually two plus one of the standard model. But for example, it could be a barrier number or a lepton number. That could be a global symmetry. We, it, it, and maybe it's not broken, but maybe it's broken. If it's broken, then you get a Goldstone boson. So, um, in the case of a lepton number, the name of such Goldstone boson is, is chosen to be a Myron. In 1980, uh, Chigashike, Mohapatra, and Pache suggested the possible breaking. Mm -hmm of a global lepton number. So Myron is one. It was never found. I don't know if you heard that people talk of axion a lot. You will hear about it daily. That has to do with a certain interesting chiral symmetry, which has to do with strong interactions breaking CP. That maybe I could tell you a few words towards the end of the course. It's too early. That has not been found. Is it also 
Okay. Yeah, it will be precisely, it's here, what, what we are saying, it's here. And notice what you get here. Catch a thing, if I go into this gauge, sorry that I call it gauge, because other people do, there is no gauge symmetry, but I'll do that. This is, this is often called a, a unitary gauge. Eventually I'll explain. Notice that all the interactions of a Goldstone bosons are derivative. I can always find such a variable that this becomes a derivative. And they are of course then cut off by the scale in question. So if you have large scales, the coupling will be weak. Or if the coupling has to be weak, the scale must be large. So let me wet your mouse. D mu will give you a, a momentum dependence. This coupling will be P mu over V. So for example, in no relativistic limit, this coupling is going to become small. Now, it, it, it's, it's, we will have to talk about the physics. I didn't introduce the fermion, so I don't know how this Goldstone boson will couple to the fermion. Will it couple to the mass, to the spin? I don't know. If you couple to the mass, then it's dangerous. You don't want to change gravity. Imagine that this guy couples to the mass. That's like ending a new force which changes Einstein's theory of gravity. And that, of course, should give you this Cavendish type experiments, should be seeing that. So you can imagine the limits must be fantastic. I can try to be precise when we discuss the physics of Goldstone boson. But imagine it's coupled to the spin. Then it's not so dangerous because spin is the thing that tends to cancel. If you take a star, it's not going to have a big spin. Obviously, right? Because there is one spin going up, one spin going down, one spin going zero. The average spin of a star must be a number of the one and not 10 to the whatever, 50, 60, I don't know. The, 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 the number of protons in, a, in, a, in the Earth is huge in the star. It turns out that they are coupled to spin, and therefore they don't do any damage. Okay, it took time to understand. But, and this is sort of the beginning the, uh, of the beauty of, uh, the, to me, one of the most beautiful examples of astroparticle physics, is that what can happen, let, let's think of astro, okay, a little digression, not learning, we'll come back to this, just a little story. If they couple to the fermions, say to the quarks and leptons, then this guy could be produced in the, in the stars. They're massless. So there will always be enough energy to produce a goldstone boson, just the way you produce the photon. They are thermonuclear process in the star and they, you know, are, are very uh, beneficial to us, okay. They produce a lot of photons and, okay, today maybe there was not so many, but we could see. But the same way they would be producing stars produce neutrinos. You, you must know that, right? Obviously, these are massless particles, basically. So would the Goldstone bosons be produced? So you can imagine if the coupling of a Goldstone boson is not small, the star will start cooling off too quickly. You don't want to, to screw up the process of the uh, uh, photon emission in a star. You don't want the sun to die too quickly. <coughs> so from there, for example, you can put good limits on the couplings, okay? And it turns out, if you wish, what you are learning here, that the scale, I can always shape, transform my statement about the small coupling into a statement of the scale. I can have also bosons as long as the scale is large. I'll have to say how large. At this point, I don't want to say anything more. I'll have to be more systematic if I want to give you more information. What else? I think if you have a question, I want to go on. I'm not going to prove the Goldstone theorem. I will may decide to prove it. I want to do it on the examples. 
I, I myself like that. I like to get a feel. I don't like formal proofs, okay, obviously by the type of research that I do. So I want to see, I want to prove the theorem which says every time a certain generator is broken, what does it mean that it's broken? This is it. This charge is broken because it does not annihilate vacuum. Vacuum carries the charge. The symmetry is broken. Every time this happens, Goldstone well, proves there will be a massless particle associated with that. It's not surprising, there will be more of these flat directions, if you wish. So from a surface, I want to go to a two-dimensional sphere. If I take a two-dimensional sphere, how many would you expect? Two, because there will be two directions which are equipotential. Two not trivial, Nicolas. You say that physics will not depend on the vacuum we choose? The physics cannot depend on the vacuum we choose. Mm. Because I had the symmetry, I had the right to choose any which one. There was no distinction between them. This is an equipotential surface. What is important that I can stably live at one point, that it costs me infinite energy to go from one point to another, that is very important, okay. And we found out in the discrete case that there is no tunneling to worry about, okay. I could use similar arguments here. We'll talk about it when we go to the Higgs case. If this is true, what I'm saying, then of course it cannot depend on which point I choose. Did you say anything, good uh, traveling along the well, I, I said, this is a statement about traveling along the circle. It costs me no potential energy. So there cannot be a massive particle in that direction. The, 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 you know, that's why this notation is nice. Because this is the phase. You see, I've taken the phase of the field. This is precisely the equipotential direction. What, what it means is that the potential does not depend on the phase. This is the symmetry in question. This is the U1 symmetry. So the phase... <laughs> notation is very useful to understand what is going on. It's not useful to do calculations with derivative coupling. However, it's useful to understand the form of the coupling. The coupling will always be proportional, no matter what other notation you choose. It's always going to be 1 over V. Because in this basis it is 1 over V. So it has to be in others. may not be easy to see, but it has to be. And the smaller momentum, the smaller the coupling. That's for sure. Just yes, curious. Kevin. Is it useful to think of this as money? I mean, I just, I just think that uh, like the vacuum is like geodesic. Yeah, you can write. Yes. Sure, you can think precisely of a manifold. That's why we call it a vacuum manifold. And so the topology of this vacuum manifold is, is, is what determines the physics. Yes. So the trick is always to find the manifold in question, and that will tell you immediately how many goals <coughs> we should get. We can be guessing. Then, of course, we go on and confirm it. But if we are quick in understanding the topology, it will be uh, 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 gaining, you know, an insight, a quick insight. Nicolas? So the number of these goals bosons will be the number of the generators of the symmetry which is broken? Or? Precise. Now, maybe it's important to say that. There is one, however, point, a caution. You know, I should put a stop sign, a, a red caution. Imagine that th there are two U1 symmetries. I could say, look, this guy, there is one U1 symmetry. Imagine an example in which I like to have U1 cross U1. I have the right to assume that. And the charge with this U1 I call Q1 and the charge of this I call Q2, okay? Anyway, I want to break them, so who cares how many there are, okay? A number of broken symmetry may be infinitely large. Maybe we live in the world in which a group, symmetry group is SU-147, I don't know. If it's broken, I don't know if the scale is large. So then you, what I mean, so let's choose that Q1 on phi is plus 1, and Q2 on phi, let's say, is minus 1, to give you an example. We can imagine that example. Notice that both of these charges will break the vacuum. If the vacuum expectation value is non-zero, you will find out that Q1 
phi 0 is phi 0 and q2 phi 0 is minus phi 0. So I ask you, so what is the symmetry breaking? And you'll be tempted to say, well, there are two broken phages, u1, cross u1, broke down to nothing. Well, one has to be careful. It's impossible, really, to break with one field two symmetries in the same direction. These are two u1 symmetries which compute, because notice q1 plus q2 acting on phi 0 is 0. So the number of broken generators is not uh, two; it's one. Because instead of working with Q1 plus Q2, Q1 and Q2, I could work with the sum and the difference. The difference is broken; the sum is not. So there is no rule, as always, to tell you it's true what you ask me. Yes, to every really broken generator corresponds a massless particle that we call Goldstone or number Goldstone boson would be our correct name. But we should be careful in counting the number of broken generators, okay? And I, when I teach you, I'll try to be careful, okay? You have to be careful, this is very important. You, I often get papers to referee, which are wrong. People don't notice that they have more symmetry. And maybe they have more or less Goldstone bosons, okay? The two things you have to, oh, another thing, sorry. You have to do this to be sure. People think that they have more Goldstone bosons. Sometimes you are lazy to check when you have a complicated field and a large representation, say, uh, of a large group. Second thing also that your potential may have more symmetry than what you think. I'll give you an example. You say, aha, uh -huh, I'd like to have a discrete symmetry. Okay? So suppose that I wanted to take a complex field with a discrete symmetry. I would write the potential like this. But it has more symmetry. So the symmetry is not what I say. The symmetry is what comes out once I write down my Lagrangian. Okay. So you have to be very careful when you're studying the model you want to imagine, example you want to imagine. There may be more symmetry. And we'll be... Uh, we'll have a homework that will emphasize that, a, a highly non-trivial homework. It normally students suffer with. We don't feel bad if you suffer with that. It's a highly non-trivial example that some of the best learning comes from suffering, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's true. You never forget it afterwards. Okay. So I'm sort of, uh, you know, I want to be as slow as possible. Okay, this was a side comment. So in other words, you have always had to worry that there is some linear combination, AQ1 plus BQ2. You say, aha, uh -huh, two are broken, now I look for the linear combination and then you check with the arbitrary coefficients whether there is a particular linear combination which is not broken. Okay. Well, we can be systematic, we can do that. So in order to get a grasp at the Goldstone theorem, let's take a more complete example here. There was only one charge, so there could have been only one Goldstone boson. Let's take a model with more charges. What is the next one I could take? I'll take a real representation, we often call the SO3, when there is a real representation. Or that's an SU2 with the adjoint. But okay. well, let me write it the way typically write, people write in the books. Let me take SO3 global. So you can write your field as a vector, or you can write it as it's more common. I won't use a vector notation, I will use a notation which is useful for any SON with a fundamental representation, you write as a column, and then phi transforms as e to the i ta theta a, say, of large phi a to phi. Okay, now this is a multiplet, let's give it a... And ta, you know it, we discussed that, ij is minus i epsilon ijk. 
they must be, it's very easy to see, they must be Hermitian, but since the rotation is real, they must be imaginary, and they are easy to say that they are anti-symmetric. These are structure constants of the SU2 group. How will the potential look like? Lambda over 4, phi transpose, phi. Square. Just a vector. It was just the, the absolute value of the vector square, right? There is no other invariant. If you think about it, there cannot be more invariant. SO3 is rank 1. Group of rank 1 turns out to have 1 invariant. Group of rank 2 will have 2 invariants. You will see when we discuss SO3. If you do, there will be 2 invariants. We probably will. And it's easy to see there will be one invariant. I can always rotate the vector in one direction. I can take it along the z-axis. In that case, it has only one component. With one component, I'll get one invariant. So it's not surprising that this is the most general potential I can write. So uh, I don't know how to draw this. I could do the circle, you know, I could do the sombrero potential, but what do I do with, the, with this one? Can you tell me what will be the Machio manifold be here? M0 is set of all the points phi 0 so that V equal is at minimum V is equal 0 and that is set of all points which is phi 1 0 squared plus phi 2 0 squared plus phi 3 0 squared is V squared. What is this? Two it's a 2 sphere. How many goals from bosons do I expect? I expect the two generators broken, or I'm guessing, okay, because I have two equipotential, okay, we'll check them. Well, it's not hard to check them. Notice that T3, T3, oh, now again, I'm sorry, Nicolas, if that's what worries you, as you worried before, I'm going to pick up one vacuum, and I'm going to take this one, and here I would really, um, By the way, I took it, this guy to be real, so my kinetic energy will be d mu phi transpose. I will put a half here when the fields are real. That's my convention. When it's complex, I normalize the complex field with the square root of 2, so I don't put that half here. Or sometimes I may do any, as long as we are consistent. Doesn't matter where I put a half. Five zero zero. Yeah, I can always rotate it because of the symmetry. I can always choose a particular direction. I can live on this point. And just to be sure, take another point. Just convince yourself that you get the same physics. You should get two Wilson bosons, and that the mass of the Higgs boson is the same. Okay, this is very important. Okay. Now notice that in this case T3 acting on phi 0 is 0. T3 acts in the 1, 2 space. It's trivially 0. But T1 and T2 are obviously non-zero. And there can be no linear combination that cancels because they act in different spaces. So I don't have to worry that by summing then I will get 0. One works in the 2, 3 space, the other in the 1, 3 space. Okay, they can never add up to 0. I got two broken generators. Two broken generators. I expect two goldstone bosons. Okay, I'm going to write phi as G2 minus G1, I think something like this, I don't know. forgive me for this 2 and 1, you will understand in a second what I chose them, it's just a name anyway, who cares, and I think you can guess immediately, you see the guy that it's not massless is the guy that, that lives near the vacuum, the other guys are going to be massless. 
But to show that, because I'm lazy now, I want to go to that smart physical unitary gauge. Not a gauge, but... In other words, I can write. This is one way of writing. So let me not write like this, but at least you guess why I did it. Let me write like this. E to the I, T1, G1, plus T2, G2, over V. 0, 0, V plus H. I can expand them, right? T1 minus I, I, 0, 0. T2, 0, 0, minus I. Remember there is always 1 over V to get the right dimension. This has to be dimensionless. I write like this, this is correct. These guys do not that late. I could even write, if I'm lazy, you know, I don't have to worry which guy breaks or doesn't break. I can write T-A-G-A, -A. I could have written here. T-A-G-A, -A. A is one, two, three. Why? Because T3 gives me zero anyway. So when you want to be quick and you want to have a nice notation, just sum over all the generators, because those that are zero will be zero. You're going to be picked up. The unbroken one. So notice that when I expand this, if I take the leading term, this is 1 plus i, t1, g1 plus t2, g2, over v. Acting on this, what will I get? t1 is here, i and minus i, so this will give me g2. Notice I will get G2 minus G1, V plus H, plus etc. This is what I wrote there. Why am I taking this? Because from here, phi transpose phi is just V plus H squared. I got the same potential I had in the discrete to say. You see how it's boiling down always to the discrete guy? And that's why I want you to learn that example very well. There are more complicated things, theories beyond the standard model when there may be additional particles. But all the way to the standard model will all get, always get the same thing. From here, I don't have to do any calculation. mg1 is mg2 is 0. Because these guys have disappeared from the potential. They are in the kinetic energy. But their masses must be 0. Imaginative particles, they are real particles. They are real particles. So, uh, In this example, if there was an SU3 global symmetry, and some of us, or many people, you know, we have more families. And the families are very strange thing. They are they are zero copies of each other. The universe is made out of up, down, quark, electron, neutrino. But then you get other families which are exactly the same. Up, down, electron, neutrino. They are called chum, strange, muon, neutrino. Top, bottom. If there is another generation, then you call it T prime, B prime, I don't know, whatever. So, you know, and they are, they, they, they are exactly the same, except that they are one guy is heavier than the other, you know. So you could think, oh, maybe there is a global symmetry here which is spontaneously broken. Why not? So you can imagine that it's tempting to think about that. There's an interesting physics that will come out of this Goldstone boson. Okay? I can't talk too much about them as interesting as it is because they have not been observed and it has nothing to do with the standard model. That's beyond the standard model physics. Okay? But yes, to answer your question, the issue particle that should be seen. And this is why we have to worry whether they are coupled to the mass or the spin and so on. We have to worry whether they are producing the stars. We have to understand how much they can couple, etc., etc. Uh, but in practicality, or in the theories that we don't have those particles, we calculate something. And we try to extend the theory with this spontaneous symmetry breaking, having those bosons. Uh, our calculations still give the same answer because 
the scale that we talked about before is such that it's not affecting our previous uh, calculations. If the scale of this symmetry is very large, what does it mean? Large compared to which scale? The scale of the standard model. Okay, there is one scale we know today firmly of symmetry breaking that's MW equal MZ equal 100 GV. So imagine that the scale is, I don't know, 10 to the 19 GV. Very likely you will never see these particles. However, you better be careful. There could be some small trace. So at least, you know, they appear in the cosmology, okay? They did something in the early universe. Or they destabilize your star and so on. So you could look for them in, in not in at LSC, obviously. So anyway, even if the scale is large, you better think twice before uh, uh, just ignoring them. For example, people found out that the sun would die unless the scale was uh, uh, 10 to the 19 <coughs> years. So imagine how huge number you get just from the fact that the sun keeps uh, heating us. And then you can get better limits when you think of bigger stars. Red giants, you know, they are much bigger than the sun. So you may get huge limits on these particles, or in other words, you may find some, something it may come out from the astrophysics, okay? So, so it's not just physics, it's the astrophysics and cosmology of ghost of ozones is a very exciting topic. And to this day, people talk about the axiom whose scale is supposed to be 10 to the 12 GV. In spite of being so big, it's one of the most popular extensions of the standard model. But it's um, a little bit ridiculous because people theorize it and push it outside of the uh, I know. experimental. I know. Maybe we should be, uh, I don't know. we'll be punished one way or another for our ambitious extrapolations of energy scales to orders of orders of magnitude. Well, what can I tell you, okay? I'll, I'll mention some of that in the end of the course and you lose your own judgment, okay? I would say the following. I was reading this beautiful response of Glesho on a book that is bugging Glesho and me. I'm going to have to write, I will see whether it's, because this woman that wrote a book Look at me. Sabina, that doesn't matter. So the whole book is, you know, dealing with, with, with what is beautiful in physics. The people who tell you, oh yeah, I'm after beauty, I don't care whether it is realistic or not. Delicate business, right? I can't imagine beauty without theory being predictive. To me, it's false. I don't believe that the authors who claim that the beauty actually believe in that, because we are physicists, by definition, we don't use the same criteria as a mathematician would do or a painter would do. If the theory is beautiful, it doesn't have to be right, as long as they make clear, firm predictions. So then I wouldn't worry so much. Imagine you have the standard model in 1961, you write the glacier in 1967, it took many years to find W and Z boson. But what was nice is that the theory made very clear and firm predictions. So you could say, okay, let me be patient and we'll go and, 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 and find it. So it's not so much the ambition of the scale as your capacity to show that the theory is self-contained. What else could we have here? Ah, why not? But this is this clear? Please, I can't lose you here. So notice that we are kind of proving Cold Stone Theorem. Two broken generators, two uh, We'll take another example with three broken generators and I'll stop there. Okay. The thing maybe to say is that I could have this was SO3 with what we call a vector representation. Or spin one, we would say. 
I could have also used the SU2 language with a join. Remember we said I can always adjoin the representation to the group in which the number of uh, independent fields is equal to the number of generators, which is three. That of course must be equal to vector, okay? Or in other words, a joint. We said in any group, let's at least speak, talk about SUN, T B T A T B I F A B C T C a joint representation transforms with the generators which are the structure constants. This is a joint. So in other words, in this case, the adjoint representation, I don't know whether, let me use the same, or let me not, let me call it sigma. Sigma transforms as u, sigma u dagger. This is a definition of an adjoint representation, which is equivalent to that, where u is e to the i, t a, theta a, and t a correspond to the fundamental. We checked it the other day. I mean, what does it mean here? What does this mean, what I wrote? This transforms into u is 1 e to the i t a. Let's take a small transformation. Sigma 1 minus i t a theta a. Right? Assuming what I get is sigma plus i theta a t a sigma. In other words, a joint representation, we can say here, for example, one way of saying it, that the generator in the adjoint representation acting with sigma acts as a commutator. You understand what I'm saying here. This is the formal form for the generator. I will give it a hat. I think of sigma we like this as a generator. Okay. Now notice if if sigma transforms this way, sigma dagger also sigma dagger transforms the same way. You agree? I, you know what we do when we have a presentation? We look for the irreduci irreducible ones. The smallest representation that have that kind of transformation property. So in other words, I can take from here sigma equals sigma dagger. Since they transform the same way, that's going to be irreducible. That's the first state. The second statement, the trace of sigma is invariant. The cyclic property of the trace, right? u, u dagger is 1. So it means that I can take trace sigma 0. That means <coughs> that I can expand sigma as tb, phi b, sum over all the generators. These are generators in the fundamental representation. I can write, this becomes a matrix, it becomes a Hermitian traces matrix, which I can expand in the basis of the original. Notice, this will give me the commutator between TA and TB, but that will give me FABC. So you see the adjoint, which transforms through the structure constant, can be written in a more elegant manner by just knowing the transformation properties. I said this the other day, I'm repeating it again, it's very important. All I have to know is the Pauli matrices, the fundamental ones or gamma matrices for SU3 or glacial georgia matrices for SU5 those are people that wrote SU5 theory we don't know what it is but I won't let you leave here before telling you the last day okay. why I keep mentioning SU5 so obviously in the case of SU2 that becomes a vector. F becomes epsilon, and then of course it's the same transformation property as the vector has. 
Well, it had to be, because there is only one three-dimensional representation in SO3. So the adjoint has to be the vector. So I could have written, all I meant to say, instead of working with this, I could have used this notation. And this may be better in general, because you can apply it to any group, as you have group. So in other words, there there was five transpose five. How would I write the invariant? I would write it at trace sigma square. And let's see what trace sigma square is. It's trace TA, TB, phi A, phi B, from here. Which is, how do I normalize these guys? This is phi A, phi B, trace T A, T B. How are they normalized? Pauli matrices. This is SU2. Two. No, half. Generated a half a Pauli matrix. Right, but one half. Right, T A sigma A over 2. This is SU2. By the way, you've now learned the convention. In SUN, we use the same normalization. We must use it. Why? Because SUN groups have SU2 subgroups. And therefore, you have to normalize consistently. You can't change it. In SUN, you cannot choose a different normalization. It has to be the same that you use in SU2. Because in SU3, for example, we have a subgroup, which is SU2. That's why Gelman normalizes the same way as Pauli. So notice that the trace sigma square is what I called previously phi transpose, phi transpose, phi transpose phi up to a factor of two. So I can work with a vector, I can work with a column, I can work with a Hermitian matrix which is traceless, it will always give me one and the same result obviously. In the case of a vector, I can always, what is the logic you say? Well, maybe this is an important comment, okay. That I would have forgotten to make. Notice that I studied, I should have said this here, the symmetry was SO3. And it, it got down broken through phi 0, 2, Yeah, we call that U1. U1, thank you. The only one? Only T3 remain. So we write like this. didn't have one real field. With one real field, I could not have you one. But I have three fields. So I can still rotate around the z-axis. I still have components phi 1 and phi 2. That's a complex field. There's a symmetry in terms of phi 1, phi 2, or g1 and g2. That you can rotate any which way you want. Right, whether I work with G1, G1, G2, or a linear combination, cosine G1 plus sine G2, and so on, it, it wouldn't make any difference. T3? Good question. T3 was the Pauli matrix on the first. Uh, In this case, I didn't you remember there are no Pauli matrices. There will be the matrices are epsilon. Okay. Yeah. In this case, there, there is no Pauli matrix. We'll come, we'll come to that. In this, In this way, you argue the following. A vector I can always choose. How did the reasoning go? Without doing much calculation, say I can always rotate the vector in one direction. You always used to do that, by the way. When I say that I can choose one vacuum, we used to say, oh, I can always call the, 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 uh, the, the z direction in pointing where my vector is. Okay, it's a choice of coordinate system, if you wish. I can always do that. One vector always goes in the z direction. Therefore, there is still a rotation around the z axis. And I have a complex field 
which has two components, G1 and G2. So out of G1, I can write down the components G1 plus IG2 and call it a complex, some U5 prime, which is complex. I don't know how I would call it, okay? But I can do that. So I will have a rotation which is SO2. U1 is SO2. It's the same thing. T3 generates only... Precisely. T3 is... is, is, is Zero generates I precisely. I Notice an interesting thing that if the U1 is not the usual U1, actually we should be a little careful. In U1, T3 is arbitrary. Charge is arbitrary. Here it's quantized because we lived in SO3. So it's an interesting story. You break it down into a very particular manner. For example, at Hoff will show you that in this theory you get magnetic monopoles. Okay, it's just a digression. Remember what I said, the Dirac says, if there is a monopole, charge will be quantized. It's my bombing how he got it. Forget that. That's a very hard, non-trivial paper to read. Ed Hoff says, a Polyakov, if you have charge quantization in, in theories like SO3, SO2, charge is quantized. Matrix is, is traceless. All the charges are proportional to the basic charge. You will find out that they are magnetic monopoles. So this U1 is a particular U1, but it's still uh, what we call U1, SO2. Or maybe we should call it SO2 if you wish. Okay, let's call it SO2. I forgot to say, in the previous example, U1 got broken to identity. Here, something remained. How do I see that? By, by thinking, I can choose a vector in one direction. Notice the original group had rank 1. The final group also the rank 1. Now look at the case of a joint. A joint is a traceless Hermitian matrix. Hermitian and traceless. Sorry. A traceless, a Hermitian matrix I can always diagonalize. In other words, I can choose sigma 0 to be in sigma 3 direction. I can diagonalize it. And it must be traceless. So I can always choose it to be like this. In, by saying that, I will now see immediately that T3 will not break it, because T3, when X on sigma 0, acts as a commutator. The adjoint representation transforms with a commutator, okay? And that, of course, will be zero because sigma zero itself is in the third component. How do I know that? Well, because it is Hermitian. So it's diagonal, it's traceless, so it must be one minus one. Now, don't this is an interesting thing that when we got a side result, and uh, well, there is some time that you don't want you to be too tired. So I won't start anything. We will talk a little more. Just make sure you absorb this. And this is what I want to say. Suppose now I ask you, I take some very big group, SU, uh, well, doesn't matter even. I take an SUN group with an adjoint. For example, I take SU5. And I want to use the adjoint. I want to see what the adjoint can do. But I'm lazy. I don't want to compute anything. So I have the following question. I know it will break to something. And I want to know what my options are. So the first question is, can a joint break the rank? We'll do, by the way, 
We'll do one nice example of a joint. It's a comb over. So you won't really learn it here, but I want you to appreciate it. With a little thought, you and I may know what is going on without actually computing. We are, what is the logic? What is a rank or a group? It's a number of cartons, right? Mm -hmm. Numbers of generators that mutually commute. A cartan subalgebra determines the rank. <coughs> so we said in SU2 rank is 1, in SU2 is 2 because there is T3 and T8 which commute. In SU5 there will be How would you reason? Look, SU2, it's made out of Hermitian traces matrices. How many diagonal Hermitian, how many diagonal traces matrices you have? One is called sigma 3, 1 minus 1. It's really eigenvalues. In SU2, in SU3, a little group theory without fancy knowledge. So in SU2, so let's talk about Cartan. A little digression, so I don't start anything new. Just reminding you of, of, of group theory that you know, but you don't know that you know, because you know it in a more formal way. <coughs> okay, but I want you to know it here. So in SU2, Cartan is only T3. Why? Because all I can do is I can choose one of them and diagonalize it. Let me write proportional. It has to have real eigenvalues, it's diagonal, so it's 1 and minus 1. SU3? Well, let's come to that. I can choose one of them to be like this. Right? They must be orthogonal to each other. So, I can always choose one of them like this. The other one must be then? 0, 1 minus 1. It must be orthogonal, so it must be 1, 1. What does it mean that it's a toggle? Remember the trace TATB is proportional to delta AB. So it must be this. So C is T3, T8 called. So their rank is 2. Well, it's trivia. I have 3 times 3 matrices, there will be 3 of them diagonal. But they are traceless, so I have two of them. In SU4, I'm not going to have four, I'm going to have three, because they are traceless. What I'm going to do in SU4, I will take one minus one, zero, zero, then one, one minus two, zero, and then one, one, one minus three. In SU5, there will be four of them. The rank is always S n minus one because of the tracelessness. And you just build it out of Pauli matrices, you start T3, then orthogonal, then orthogonal and so on. So, <coughs> but notice an interesting thing. Let me just summarize here. A joint representation sigma transforms as u sigma u dagger, which is equivalent that ta sigma is a commutator. And of course, I take trace sigma zero and sigma sigma there. Because of this commutation relation, that tells me that when TA acts is on the fields, so I can write sigma TA phi A, I'm summing over repeating index. Then of course, the, the Generators have the form of structure constant when I come phi A because I get commutators here. But notice, I can always sigma zero, a vacuum expectation value, the value of the field in the minimum. I don't care what the group is. But I know it's commission, so I can always diagonalize. You agree? Whatever group you give me, maybe SU 147, I can take this to be diagonal. So sigma zero, by definition then, commutes with all the diagonal matrices. 
it tells you that it lives inside Kartan. Right? Sigma zero commutes with Kartan. With all the matrices that are inside Kartan, they are diagonal. What is a Kartan subgroup? It's just a, 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 a maximal number of diagonal matrices you can write. Mutually orthogonal. So a joint cannot break the ring. That's a very interesting statement. I don't have to know anything about the details of this. I know the rank will be preserved. Why? Suppose you tell me that you believe... You see how powerful group theory can be? You tell me, oh, I believe that the world is based on SU5 cement. For some reason. And I say, okay, I don't... Well, I'm reluctant to take it, but for instance, no, no, I have this intuition and so on. How I tell you, well, you say I'm going to break it by some field, phi zero, down. Well, I tell you, well, what you have to achieve, this symmetry better be preserved. I know that the standard model symmetry is good. I've checked that. It's a gauge symmetry. It's based on all the interactions are symmetric. There is spontaneous symmetry breaking, but that's hidden. Spontaneous symmetry breaking, you know, Nambu tells us, it's like it's not there. Okay. Forget that. The theory is invariant. So, what is the rank of the standard model? Yes, 2 for SU3, thank you, <coughs> plus <coughs> 1 plus 1 is 4. What is the rank of SU5? So you have this terrible task, or you and I should think which Higgs field, Higgs field, which scalar field should be used to break the symmetry. Now we know it should be a joint. It cannot be a fundamental or anything. Why? It has to be the representation which does not break the rank. Well, a joint is the re representation that doesn't break the rank. So it's a great thing to know. Whenever you have a, you might have a complicated group, you know. SO10 you want to break to something, SU5 times U1. For example, SO10 has a rank 5, so it happens. Well, I know. SU6, SU6 has to be broken to SU5 cross U1, say. SU6 has a rank 5, SU5 4, U1 5, so you say, oh, I'm going to use an adjoint. I know, I don't have to struggle thinking, going through 10 different representations, finding out which one preserves. It's going to be the adjoint, okay? So we've learned that the adjoint preserves the rank. And that is so explicitly in the SO3 example. SO3, now I know, had to be broken to U1. I didn't have to do any calculation. If I had just thought about it, okay, the rank had to be preserved. So it had to be U1. So when I said SO3 and I took a vector, I just closed my eyes and say, oh yeah, sure, there's going to be two Wilson bosons because two generators will be broken. The rank must be the same, and the only rank that is U1 is U1. There is no other subgroup of SO3 which has rank 1. It's only U1. It has only one subgroup. SO2. You see what I'm doing. I, I, some of my statements will be profound extrapolation of this simple example so that tomorrow you can work on SO10 if you decide to work, or maybe even more complicated exceptional group if you're interested in strings or not. Okay, you will be using simple uh, 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 techniques based on group theory. It will always boil down to what we are doing in simple examples. So I'll try to use these examples to extrapolate. If that gets very hard for you, forget it. You all you have to know what happens in a simple example. Uh, in the SO3 example, uh, we based it on the vectorial representation, and we found that the vacuum manifold is an S2, and that's enough to reason that if we choose one direction, uh, two of the generators will break the symmetry, but not the third one, but it was all based on the vectorial representation discussion. 
Yes. Nothing. So what you are learning, okay, sorry, I'll interrupt and then you go on. What you are learning, the breaking depends not just on the group you start with, but on the representation you choose, okay? We took you one and of course there was just one representation we could take. It had to be complex then and we broke it. When the groups are bigger, then it's not much enough to specify the group. We must specify the representation, yes. So, criteria joint one? Since you know the action is through the commutators and we can count diagonal uh, generators, we can just, uh, just, we did the reasoning just right now. But for uh, the groups that cannot be represented by a, a joint representation, we cannot make this reasoning, right? We can only sign the joint representation. A joint representation based on the generators. A joint representation is, is, is a joint to the generators. One way to define it is here. There are always structure constants in a group. The other way is to, you see what I've done, I expanded it in the basis of the original generators. That I can always find. I have my original generators, so there is always a joint representation. Whether it's SU group or SO group or exceptional group, you have your generators, you will have your joint representation. Like the first reason is we have a set of vacuum. Uh, which constitutes the vacuum manifold, and we apply some transformations on the uh, chosen vacuum point. So, uh, sure, but it had to do with the representation I've taken. I already assumed that it was a joint. When I took a vector, that was a joint. But if our vacuum manifold is not something that has an SU and symmetry, whatever it has, you have to specify the representation. So, are you doing a joint or not? Uh, I don't know. No, I'm just talking about some vacuum manifold that our theory has. No, no, it has to do with the, the representation you're choosing. There is no vacuum manifold to start with. Uh -huh. The vacuum manifold depends on the, okay, this is it. Uh, I have taken, and this is why I, 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 I will, you know, we drill you with symmetry breaking. By the way, I, I'm, I'm working out this example in detail. There is no such example in nature yet. In the standard model, we are not using the joint. So I could, I will do next example on Monday. I will take SU2 and I will take a doublet representation, a fundamental. And you will see that the symmetry breaking will be different. So you cannot associate vacuum manifold to your theory unless you specify the scalars. It's not enough to say what your group is. You have to tell me what your scalar is. Only then you and I can start talking about the vacuum manifold. Let me see if you'll guess. We started the 10, 15 minutes after class. So let me, let me see if you can guess. Phi is a doublet. How can I write a doublet? I can write this as phi up and phi down. <coughs> right? Phi transforms into u phi. What is the invariant? Phi dagger phi. Phi dagger thank you. Obviously. And therefore, <laughs> potential will be, I'm embarrassed, it's always, it's that simple that, so, you know, I should teach you something non-trivial. It's just one term, rank one. You can convince yourself, you can try to write some others, you will see. There is lambda, I don't care. So what is the vacuum manifold when this vanishes, right? So the vacuum manifold, M0 is set of all points phi zero, so that phi zero dagger, phi zero is V squared. Can you guess what the manifold is? Just let's spend two, three minutes, okay, and then, you know. Forget it, the class is over. It's just tell me in the next two, three minutes what we have. Okay, don't tell. Me. Think about it on Monday, you tell. Me. Let me not tell. I'd be very happy if you tell me that you thought about it. Try not to read it in a book or in a paper. See what I did in the in the real case. I wrote it down in terms of the component that was useful, okay? It's because I couldn't see immediately, so I wrote phi one square plus phi two square plus phi three square equal v square. That's s two. So I would suggest something analogous. Uh, s three or something like that. 
Why S3? Now that my head said it, because there are two complex components, there are actually four real components. Phi dagger phi is just phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared plus phi 3 squared plus phi 4 squared. That's S3. So you see the, the, the vacuum manifold change. So yes, I can answer your question about the vacuum manifold, but I have to know what the scalar representation is. But it's always some S to the end, and we always have S U N symmetries. Like, is there any other example? It's I don't know, maybe it should be like that. Representation, there will be a number of invariants, so it's not that trivial. Yeah. It's not, it won't be just that. Uh, you can see that I don't work on formal. It's a nice question that you asked me, okay? I end up saying no. Well, let me not answer it. Because it's not, you know, you say one field, one invariant. No, there may be many invariants. For example, if I have a large group. Rank is large, and therefore it can be many variants. Example, take uh, SU3. I can write trace sigma square for the joint, for example. But I can also write trace sigma Q. The rank is two, so these are invariant. There is also uh, uh, trace sigma to the fourth, but it cannot be independent. It's going to be a function of the someone who's going to be related to the one I've written. If I take a larger sphere, there will be many invariants I could write. Trace of this, trace of that. I got a thing. Nice question. I'll stop here. Just because you need some rest, you have a class at four. Some of you 